Um, do I have to do the thing that I do with my children? The one, two, three eyes on me? Do I have to do that? Okay. <laughs> I still do that, they're in high school. Okay, so this is a session that um, I, um, there's, it's so extraordinary because you're gonna take a journey and meet some really phenomenal human beings working in our field. Um, and, and, but for um, this, these awards, you might not have, you might not hear about them. So I think it's, um, it's a really important session and we get to go deeper um, with some of these individuals. So I'm very excited about it. Before we go there, um, after the diversity plenary panel, um, uh, somebody came up to me to talk to me about something that they do at their conferences. And um, it is something when I was at a US peace building conference that was done too. And one of the things is that um, in the United States, all these lands belong to somebody else before we were here. <laughs> and um, so I asked her to do a little research for me and ask um, what were the indigenous peoples here? Um, the Pamunki, did I, I, I'm not sure, I'm terrible um, at pronunciation, but, um, and she asked us, to um, acknowledge their community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations, and realize um, and know that we um, were demonstrating a commitment to the beginning of the process to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler co colonialism. So thank you. I, there she is. She's in the back. She's waving. <laughs> thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. OK, so I am now pleased to introduce uh, the Purdue Peace Award. AFP was uh, lucky enough to be asked to um, help with this and judge this award. And I am pleased to introduce Dr. Stacey Huntington, the director of the Purdue Policy Research Institute at the Purdue University, and Mill Lowenstein, who is an individual donor. And they're going to talk about the Peace Building Challenge Big Idea. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Stacy Connaughton. I'm the director of the Purdue Policy Research Institute at Purdue University, also the home of the Purdue Peace Project. And of course, next to me is someone who needs no introduction to you all, a dear friend and co-founder of the Purdue Peace Project, Mr. Milt Lowenstein. Milt, thank you so much for joining me here on stage today. Last year at this time, the Purdue Peace Project and the Alliance for Peace Building announced a new uh, joint initiative. We called it the Peace Building Big Idea Challenge. The Peace Building Big Idea Challenge was developed and funded by MILT with the aim of cultivating novel, innovative ideas with the potential for real impact in peace building. MILT generously donated $10,000 for such a big idea and entrusted the Purdue Peace Project and the Alliance for Peace Building to facilitate the competition. Special thanks to Liz Hume of AFP, Krista Kelly, and Kate Mitch of Purdue University for all their work on that competition. The Peace Building Big Idea Challenge created an incentive for all of us to exercise our minds and to share our ideas on peace building. And it invited anyone from anywhere in the world to share their big idea. The response was fantastic. Ideas were submitted from around the world, from citizens who lived in countries that are currently living in regions plagued uh, with conflict, or who had been, from academics, from not-for-profit organizations, multidisciplinary teams, and on. And the ideas that they sent were just as varied in approach and in strategies. The competition consisted of two stages. The first round called for a one-page summary of a big idea. From these ideas, the top 10 were invited to submit a full description of their big peace-building idea. The winner was announced in April during a live stream event that we held at Purdue University. And we're pleased to once again announce 
that Kiran Singh Sara of the International Storytelling Center and his team were the winners of the first Purdue and AFP Peace Building Big Idea Challenge. Kiran is not able to be with us here today because of a big storytelling festival that's happening um, currently, but he generously shared a video which we are proud to share with you now. Hello everybody, um, my name is Kieran Singh Sirar and I'm um, making this video actually from Jonesboro, Tennessee in the mountains of East Tennessee and here in my office here at the International Storytelling Center. I'm sorry I can't be there in DC this week um, as we're about to launch our big festival tomorrow but um, I wanted to make this very short video to tell you a little bit about the Europa Project but first of all I just want to offer my thanks. My thanks to the Purdue Peace Project, to Stacy to Kate, to Krista, and to all the people that supported the Purdue Peace Project as an initiative and the, the Peace Building Big Idea Challenge, and also to our friends at the Alliance for Peace Building that support that particular program, and all the members really that support the work of peace building um, and these particular types of programs. So thank you very much, and it's, uh, we're extremely pleased that we, we were the, um, the first awardee of the Purdue Peace Project, an excellent program to advance and to, to advance peace building in the world. Let me tell you a little bit about how that project came about. Um, I, I oversee the work of the International Storytelling Centre here in Jonesboro. I've been here six years, but the institution really started long before I was born. It started in 1973. My predecessor, Mr. Jimmy Neil Smith, was a school teacher that founded an, an event here in a small town in Appalachia to save a dying mountain town and he came up with an idea to create a storytelling event drawing from the traditions of these mountains the traditional storytellers and what happened in 1973 in one fall evening was that he brought storytellers together around 60 people came but he boldly called that particular event the National Storytelling Festival because it was the world's first public event exclusively devoted for the art form of storytelling nearly 47 years, well 47 years since that day, starting tomorrow with the 47th annual festival, that event now attracts 11,000 people from across the country and from different parts of the world. The pro idea of the Europa Project was really sort of taking all the work that's happened since 1973, not just the performance and the preservation of life performing storytelling, story storytelling through, through storytelling artists, but all the work that we've done into the research of storytelling, storytelling in uh, communicating and supporting literacy, education, peace and conflict resolution, our uh, partnerships and our work to help harness the power of storytelling to build a better world. A very recent project, and this was kind of like a personal project for me because I'm so, um, I, I really felt it was really important to put, put storytelling into this arena and that is work with our young people, particularly young people that feel at, um, vulnerable or perhaps they don't, their voice is not welcome or, and are more sort of like likely or vulnerable to be in sort of, um, vulnerable in the community to be picked up by extreme ideologies, whether that is ISIS or extreme groups, or the KKK, or radical groups, or white supremacist based organizations. Kids are kids, and all children are beautiful. And all stories matter, and their experiences matter too. When I was a young person, I, around the age of 13, 14, and you'll probably remember that too, is all it took was for someone to listen to my story, that I had something to say, or tell me that. I had something worthwhile to offer. The idea is when we started to build our programs last year, we created a project called Stories for Change, and that was to work with young people in our community and give them a storytelling curriculum and show them that they have, a, they have the means and the power within themselves to tell their own narrative, to change the narrative of themselves and the way that may be seen, and they can use that story to envision a narrative, a story for the world around them, to envision the place in Appalachia, in the United States, in the world. So it sounds very simple, but actually all of us wake up every day and we tell a story to ourselves. 
It doesn't, we don't have to be teens. We can be adults, we can be 80 years old, and we still tell that story to ourselves. And it's really important because that single story, that story that we tell ourselves, has an incredible effect and have, on how we see the story of people around us and the world around us. The Stories for Change program is now an annual event, and it's a program where we work with over 2,000 young people and to complementary admissions to help some of our underserved youth. We also do that in numerous countries around the world through toolkits and webinars and storytelling training programs, as well as the National Storytelling Festival, and for young people under the age of 30 for um, leadership programming, civic leadership programming. But in January, actually, you no, know, just before that, I was visiting my dad back in England for his uh, 70th birthday. And I started hanging out with my nine-year-old nephew He's a YouTuber and he plays games. And he was showing me some of the games that he was playing and I thought it was quite incredible because he was creating these videos but narrating the, the game itself with about four or five other young people. And they would kind of meet up and they would go on these missions together. And in a way, they were kind of crafting a narrative of their missions. And it made me think about this sort of digital space. And he has up to 3,000 followers. What an incredible tool. I also did some more research and found out that um, about 2.5 billion people around the world play computer games. Around 60% of Americans play computer games. Some of you, I'm sure, in between the breaks are playing some sort of computer game or we've played some type of game itself. It's an incredible tool. That's one third of the world's populations. We know it's an incredible tool, but it also can be harnessed as a storytelling tool. Not all digital or social media or these digital connections are bad. They can be harnessed for good. If you think about it, stories can affect the stock exchange within 24 hours. Imagine if that stock exchange is world peace, that the measurement tool is how, how is peace doing today, etc. But if kids were given the, the charge for that. So in January, when the email came through about this big peace, peace building the idea challenge, we thought we'd just, let's take how, what, what would happen if we could take the Stories for Change program and put that into the format of a game. And so Europa was born from that. We submitted our idea and then we were shortlisted. And from that point we brought a team together, a team that included anthropologists, games designers, um, communication specialists, games theorists, um, uh, cultural sustainability and storytellers, etc. And we pulled this team together and we came up with the idea of Europa. Why Europa? One of, the, one of our partners is, includes our work with NASA JPL and telling the story of some of its missions, like the Mars rover landing mission. And one more recent project has been Europa. Europa is one of Jupiter's moons and it's said to hold an ocean. And NASA suggests that if we, as a human species, were ever to go and explore uncharted territories of our of our universe, then we should build a human base on Europa. So the idea of the game is that young people are given the task to build the cache of stories that tell the story of how humanity overcame its greatest challenge. War, persecution, the climate emergency, and the other challenges that we are facing as a global society. But most importantly, what the game does, it's a prepared, it, it readies the young people in a world that truly democratizes storytelling, because storytelling is a democratic art. It belongs to everybody. And it helps us build a society based on mutual aid and mutual cooperation. When it breaks down across borders and nations around the world, but also simply to our neighborhoods, from one street to the next, to the neighborhood to the neighborhood, to state to state, across religions, across cultural backgrounds when we learn to work with one another, collect stories, and use our own stories to show how we may overcome a personal challenge, or how we can go on missions together, like my nine-year-old nephew, if we can learn about Christian legends and Muslim myths and, 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 and et cetera, the stories of our faith communities and our diverse cultural traditions, then we are understanding more of ourselves, but collectively creating a global narrative and a narrative that hopefully can be more powerful than a narrative of war. We can replace that with a narrative of peace. The game may be played over 500 years, over 100 years, but it, ultimately it's, it's suggesting and it's telling young people that your story, regardless of your personal experiences, regardless of where you come from 
it matters. And also, listening to other people's stories matters too. And in that process, we can build a society of cooperation and trust. I want to show you now just a short video, and it's a video we made um, on, a, on a shoestring budget. Um, but it's a short video, a one minute trailer, and gives you a little bit of a taste of the Europa Project. And if you have any more questions, please reach out to us. And I hope you have a wonderful peace con. Thanks again to the Purdue Peace Project, um, Purdue University, and all my friends there at the Alliance for Peace Building. And I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Goodbye. The world is in trouble. What's at stake is nothing less than humanity. War, gang violence, terrorism, mass shootings. We so often choose hate and divisiveness when we should spend our time trying to understand one another. What if there were a way to fight back? A tool with incredible powers to transcend time and space. The ancient art of storytelling. Using state-of-the-art game theory, we can harness two of the most powerful forces in the universe. Storytelling and people's insatiable appetite for video games. We're creating a game where players can work in dynamic teams or go down the path alone, collecting, sharing, and creating all kinds of different stories to connect with one another and solve problems in real life communities or tackle big problems that are facing our world. Led by the International Storytelling Center with the support of the Purdue Peace Project, the Alliance for Peace Building, a world-class team of game designers will take on their biggest challenge yet. In a world where stories matter, anything's possible. Kieran and Team's project is an innovative one, an exciting one indeed. And now we are pleased to announce one more exciting piece of news. Again, thanks to the generosity of MILT, uh, the Purdue Peace Project and the Alliance for Peace Building are once again co-hosting uh, the Peace Building Big Idea Challenge. MILT, thank you again for hosting last year and for your generosity to allow us to host it again this year. More information can be found out at the Purdue Policy Research Institute's booth. The deadline for one-page submissions is November 4th. We look forward to hearing from you. Thanks again. So thank you. Um, and I don't know if, who knows Karen. He is... Um, He's a character, and he is one of the most amazing human beings. And uh, we promise next year we're not going to have the conference at the same time of the international storytelling, because I, I want to go. I want to go to the festival next year. So the next thing is um, the Melanie Greenberg Award, the U.S. Award for Excellence. And this is a privilege for me to introduce. I don't even think I need to introduce her, but as my former supervisor. Um, this award was named, obviously, for her. Um, and before I talk about the award, I want to talk about Melanie. So, peace building is truly in Melanie's DNA. She's kind, she's compassionate, she's patient, and she always has time for you. Even when things were exploding, you could go and sit down and talk to her about something. Um, she is one of the most active listeners you will ever meet. She actually puts the active in active listening. Um, when I worked for Melanie, people would always ask me, um, is she as lovely as she seems? Come on, like, tell me the real. <laughs> Jen's laughing. She is, who you see is who she is behind closed doors. I can tell you that. Um, she's brilliant, she's eloquent, and I was so fortunate to have worked for her and I'm so fortunate to say that she is still my very dear friend. Um, when she told me she was leaving AFP, I cried. <laughs> um, and then I was in denial for a while. Um, and then it was real, she was leaving. And I wanted to um, think of a way of how she could, she's always gonna be part of AFP, but how does she really, you know, tie to AFP? Um, and we talked with the board and 
One of um, the things we came up with was this award. Um, when I first started working at AFP many years ago, Melanie had just come back from uh, grand jury duty. And she was blown away by the fact of the violence and the conflict that was just happening blocks away from where our office was. Um, I think she spent about a month on grand jury duty. And you know, this is before the 2016 election, this is before that time, um, and we started talking about how we needed to do something. It was hypocritical for us to talk about working overseas, but not work in our own backyard. Um, so I, you know, we, we talked about it, um, and the board and, and I decided that this was, this was a great way to honor her. So with that, I'm gonna introduce you to Melanie, who needs no introduction. friends, I'd actually written into my, um, into my notes that Liz will recognize the great self-control I'm having and not getting weepy, but I think that that was probably too optimistic, so you'll have to just bear with my emotion. So thank you, Liz, and thanks to all of you for being here and creating what has always felt to me like an oasis, a family, a well of innovation and positive spirit, um, even as we face these deeply troubling times around us. I just want to give my deepest thanks to Uzra, to Liz, to Jessica, to the whole AFP staff, to the board, past and present. It's been wonderful over the last three days, two or two days, to see three generations of AFP leadership at the board and executive level coming together in our community. But mostly I want to thank all of you, not only for this magnificent conference, but for all you do to bring peace to the world against all odds. And I can't even begin to describe the joy that this award in my name brings to me. Um, the chance to highlight the brave, creative work that peace builders are doing so selflessly and often under the radar here in the United States. Um, I grew up in New Haven, Connecticut, a place of, of great violence, even in the shadow of, of an institution of Yale. Um, and have seen in all my work from the 1980s forward these pockets of wonderful work being done in the United States, primarily at a community level, that's not recognized and was never really called peace building. And so to see our community come together and recognize that A, the United States is not an exception, we have very deep issues of polarization and violence, but also that we have a community that's working on these issues and increasingly seeing our friends from other countries coming to help us. So I just feel that this award is the honor of my lifetime. It gives me just outsized hope for my country and for the whole world. So it is my great pleasure to introduce the three winners of the Melanie Greenberg Award for Excellence in US-based peace building. And Julie, I wonder if you'd like to join me on the stage for this. Because one of our awardees is from Milwaukee and I have seen up close and personal the change that you have made to Milwaukee and your efforts for peace. And I feel that we just have to give this award together. Is Bria here? Yes, she's here. So what if I announce the names of the three winners and then you can yes. give to Bria and, and then I'll move on to the yes. two? Okay, so just to give the names of our three winners, we have Bria Smith, who is the president of the Milwaukee Youth Council and board member of March for Our Lives. Hamza Wertha. <laughs> Hamza Wertha, the co-founder and executive vice president of BankQ, and we'll tell you more about Hamza. and Donna Minter, the founder and executive director of the Minnesota Peacebuilding Leadership Institute. If you want to come up first, we'll give you your award, then you can sit, and then everyone else can come up.
Bria Smith is a rising star and a strong new voice in gun violence prevention and peace building, helping to lead her generation to confront the old ways of violence and limiting structures in Wisconsin and across the country. Bria seeks to break down boundaries and bring to light the horrible effects of gun violence in our own homes and communities, demanding that we confront the reality that violence starts at home and in our own cities. She asks, how can we seek peace in the world while turning our backs on violence in our own towns and our own communities? As a teenager, Bria was the president of the Milwaukee Youth Council and challenged the leaders of the March for Our Lives movement. Why was there only an uproar in response to the Parkland, house shoot, the Parkland School shooting and not to violence that were killing her friends and in the streets of Milwaukee? She was then invited to become a board member with March for Our Lives, which is the youth-led movement to end gun violence, and she has just returned from support, supporting the 2020 Presidential Gun Violence Forum in Las Vegas. Yeah. She has, by her, by her personality and her leadership abilities, she has taken the lead for her generation to make a difference and to demand to be noticed and known and watched in, in this dialogue. And as Greta said, shame on you if you don't. Shame on you if you don't. So we are lucky that she has moved from the local to the national scene. And please join me in welcoming Bria Smith, one of our incredible recipients of the Melanie Greenberg Peace Building Award of Excellence. Thank you so much, Julie. I'd, li I'd like to call out now Hamza Warfa, who I met, I think, 15 years ago while you're living in San Diego. Hamza was born in Somalia. He escaped Somalia civil war and spent three years living in Kenyan refugee camps before immigrating with his family to the United States in 94. He ultimately moved from San Diego to Minnesota, a very brave move from a weather perspective after coming from Somalia to San Diego, and is now living in Minneapolis, Minnesota. As most of you know, Minneapolis is among the largest Somali-American communities in the U.S., but you might not know is that over the past six years, there's been a significant rise in tension between the expanding Somali refugee community and the white community. As a natural peace builder and storyteller, Hamza launched his Narrative for Peace initiative called Rumi to create opportunities for his community to have authentic dialogue on citizenship, citizenship and belonging. Hamza's work with the Somali-American community has been replicated around the world, and he's gone on to become a trusted facilitator and peace builder. He's also documented his story in America, Here I Come, a Somali refugee's quest for hope. I highly recommend it. It is a book that you will not be able to put down. In addition to his work with local communities, Hamza is the highest ranking African immigrant official in Minnesota state government. He serves as a deputy commissioner for Minnesota's Department of Employment and Economic Development. And as part of this role, he oversees um, all of the employment and training programs, the Office of Economic Opportunity, the Career and Jobs Resources, and the Governor's Workforce Development Board. In his spare time, he is also the co-founder of BankQ Inc a blockchain-powered software company working to eradicate extreme poverty by connecting the unbanked to the global economy through a secure, portable, digital economic, ident economic identity platform that allows economically marginalized people to access markets and financing opportunities. Uh, BankQ was selected for an innovation award by the Obama administration and MIT. He also founded Tayo Consulting Group, which assists philanthropic clients to refine their strategic goals and identify programs to fund. I can tell you, you cannot walk down the street in Minneapolis with Hamza without 
15 people crowding at any one time to say hello, to tell him about their families, their work, their issues. He is a beautiful father, a member of the community, a peace builder, and I have to say personally, when I hear the rhetoric about immigrants and what they cost the United States, I want to break whatever device I'm on because I look at Hamza and say, my God, this is the definition of America and the generosity of spirit and the ability to bring the passion and healing. This is immigration. And it's a great pleasure now to welcome Donna Mittner, the founder and executive director of the Minnesota Peacebuilding Leadership Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. And people often ask me, well, what do I do to become a peace builder? What field should I choose? And I think it's interesting today to look across our stage and to see the different ways, the paths people have taken to peace building. Uh, so Donna has been a forensic and neuropsychologist for more than 20 years. She has witnessed patients and incarcerated people with serious, unhealed psychological trauma, precipitating passive and active violence in their lives and their communities. As she says, their peace was stolen from them. They wanted to know how to build peace back into their lives, but they didn't know how. Unhealed psychological trauma is a public health epidemic that few know about or know how to talk about or are willing to address. After attending the five-day strategies for trauma awareness and resilience, known as STAR training, she integrated STAR in Minneapolis in 2010. The STAR program integrates neuropsychology, trauma healing, resilience, restorative justice, nonviolent conflict transformation, and broadly defined spirituality. STAR facilitates grassroots peace building by transforming psychological trauma into nonviolent power. And I think it's so easy, especially when we talk about peace building from a more political perspective, to forget that deeply human element and that until we can heal at a personal and a social and communal level, there will be no healing at any level. Um, Donna was asked to offer STAR for a wide range of colleagues throughout Minneapolis and Minnesota and her institute, the Minnesota Institute in Peace Building, has offered STAR and related trainings and racial healing events to over 3,100 people. We're so delighted to welcome you here, Donna, to hear more about your work, and thank you for being the Melanie Greenberg awardee. Thank you. So, one thing that I've also learned from working with Liz is that when she keeps us on a schedule, we're on a schedule. <laughs> so we have just a short opportunity for a discussion um, among our group. We'll try to ask some provocative questions, but I encourage all of you to come to the happy hour at AFP after this to really have a deeper discussion. So everyone, 10 minutes, speed talking. Total? Total, okay. So I'm going to ask you just one question about yourself to give us a flavor of why you're here in peace building. And then one provocative question that perhaps where you could share your answer with the group, but it could perhaps spark a larger conversation later in the conference. So Bria, if I could start with you. You represent a new generation of peace builders during a time of great change and turmoil in the US. Could you just tell us what drew you to peace building? Um, can everyone hear me all right? Perfect. I'm sorry if I sound very fatigued. I just got off of a plane from Las Vegas. The 2020 election forum last night was phenomenal. Please check it out. MSNBC. I had to throw it out there real quick. Um, I would say the first thing that got me into just active, uh, activism or just advocating just the feeling of comfortability. I mean, growing up in inner city, one of the most segregated cities in the entire nation, Milwaukee, um, seeing violence in an everyday spectrum was not a thing that was out of the blue. It was very normalized. A lot of kids who look like me have the same situations and perspectives, go through different situations where we are exposed to stressors continuously, and this continuous exposure to these stressors creates this normalization of violence and of injustice, and we feel that injustice, but we can't articulate it. Um, I think the, the main thing that got me into this position of having that po platform to articulate it was actually understanding that this normalization was not normal, that I was doing 
this because of a reaction to an oppressive system and I needed to educate myself on how to get rid of that because there's kids who do not have the resources to educate themselves of this oppressive system and are continually being exposed to these stressors in these inner cities. Um, getting um, into peace building and just coming here, um, I remember writing an article about Sandra Park. She was a girl who was shot and killed in my community just in her own kitchen. Um, and attending her visual, I've attended lots of visuals of my friends who were shot and killed growing up, but her, her visual was a lot different because there were kids that were her age at the visual as well. And it, it was like I was looking at myself um, years ago when I would attend visuals of my friends. And they were crying. Her mom went outside. She was crying as well. And the whole entire community felt this heartache of just brokenness, of injustice, of being exposed, this continuous uh, exposure of stressors, of injustice. And we're not talking, we're not having these conversations of why young kids of color in these inner cities are always going to visuals are always being shot and killed but never ever giving pl given platforms or given exposure and that that continuous cycle makes you feel sick and uncomfortable and you're still normalizing the stress um, and I remember being um, uh, Madeline she contacted me and she said that she had read that article and that's when I knew that I'm not alone in this fight that Milwaukee isn't in its own silo we're not isolated in our injustice but communication and, and coalitions and building uh, bridges with people and, and understanding that we can be a collective effort is how we dismantle you know the, the platforms that we're not getting or the platforms that we are getting but not getting enough exposure for so hopefully that was like a I tried to do that really really quick to save more time but <laughs> yeah just getting into this work just by um, not having the, or just having a, a strong uh, support system of people who want young people to be revolutionaries and want to change the game and want to shift narratives, like you said before, because that's so important. Controlling your narrative is not how you, it's, it's how you're not able to get into the same injustices that you've been unfairly brought into in the beginning. Fast but powerful. Thank you, Bria. <laughs> Hamza, you started our conversation in the hall before this by saying, you know, Minneapolis and Minnesota are going to be flashpoints in the upcoming election. What are things that you are doing and that we could do collectively to ensure peace rather than violence? Well, uh, can everyone hear me? Well, thank you so much. I first want to acknowledge uh, the incredible work of uh, Alliance for Peace Building and all of the friends, you know, in this uh, field. I got involved in peace building uh, when I was young, but I did not know that this was such a sector, but feel. Uh, and so really grateful to the work of Alliance for Peace Building, which I got introduced to about 15 years ago. Um, you know, we're, uh, the, the demographic change that are happening in our country, uh, I feel like Minnesota and the Midwest is a flashpoint, uh, and it has been for some time. Uh, and so, you know, the prosperity of the state of Minnesota really depends on uh, how we build a cohesive communities. And I think that is work that cannot be done by one person, one organization. It takes a collective effort. And so I think getting proximate uh, uh, at a time when, you know, uh, the state has one of the, uh, you know, shortest, uh, but yet most challenging workforce in, this, in the country. In fact, we have about 146,000 jobs that are available with only 80,000 people looking for work. So that means for every vacant, we have, uh, for every vacant, we have uh, two people, uh, rather two vacancies, one person uh, looking for work. So how do we move even beyond the imperative and moral case, but also make the economic case for, for why we need a peaceful communities to maintain our prosperity as a state, as a country, and globally? Uh, and some of that work really revolves around young people. Uh, very honored to you know, uh, join this uh, panel and part of this award is how do we create, you know, get proximate, but also not see young people as subjects of conversations, but leading and participants of conversations. And to me, narrative change is an integral part of that. Uh, so just want to pause there uh, in the interest of time. Thank you, Hamza. And Donna, we spoke outside about some of the roots of peace building in Minnesota coming from the restorative justice ideas. Can you tell us a little bit about what drew you to this work and the link between justice and trauma and peace? Absolutely. Well, you know, one of the questions, we do community-based trainings in Minnesota 
um, to really help people understand not only being trauma-informed, but also the connection to resilience and restorative justice. So that is why I think that the STAR training, Strategies for Trauma Awareness and Resilience, is such a powerful combination. And, um, you know, when we started doing these trainings back in 2010 in Minnesota, um, you know, I, I got into learning how to, uh, uh, about STAR because in my work as a neuropsychologist and as a forensic psychologist, meeting with people who were incarcerated and doing mental health evaluations, I was like, you know, this traditional Western model understanding of psychological trauma is not broad enough. It's just not broad enough. So I was looking for a model that would inc be inclusive of, co of collective trauma, such as structural trauma, historical traumas, cultural traumas, as well as individual traumas, and that we need to have a bigger understanding of what psychological trauma is. Um, and so after I took the STAR training for my professional development, I, well, while I was taking it, I was like, you know, there might be a few people in Minnesota that would be interested in this. So um, I said to the director of STAR at the time down in Virginia, where it was created at the Center for Justice and Peace Building, you know, I'd like to bring this to Minnesota, and we're going to do this training one time, and we'll see what happens. And um, we did that in June 2010. We had a full cohort of 25 people. There were five different racial and ethnic groups represented and five different religious traditions represented. And at the end, it went so well. But at the end, the people that came said, Donnie, you've got to do this again. There are other people that are hungry for this information. And I quite honestly was like, man, I have two day jobs. <laughs> What's this going to be about? But I said, you know, um, if my community wants this, let's see what might happen. So we formed a community advisory board that was very diverse and started on this journey to start being able to really empower communities and um, to give them the information about psychological trauma, what it is, to create safe, brave spaces where they can talk about those with one another so they don't feel all alone but then also understand how the human need for justice oftentimes gets confused with the drive for revenge. That, that, that's so easy, particularly when people are overwhelmed with the trauma that's happened in their lives. Um, and so they get into these cycles of violence, of being victims and becoming aggressors. And what Star says is, you know, there are people that get out of this. How can we break free from these cycles of violence and move towards healing and, rec and reconciliation, really empowerment for, um, for individuals? So um, we started teaching this training, and now we've taught it um, 21 times in Minnesota. We've created single-day trainings that really encapsulate the STAR model within one day, aptly called Starlight. Um, and then we've also taught do restorative justice trainings. And then I could also, I want to also say, because the racial tensions are across our nation, they're also that way in Minnesota, too. I mean, it's just, we have the biggest achievement gap between students of color and uh, white folks and white kids. And, um, and so one of the ways that we're um, working with that is we do uh, a program, racial, monthly racial healing groups called Coming to the Table that bring to peop give people an opportunity to use restorative justice principles, philosophies, and practices to talk about race and to build relationships, and then out of those relationships, actions can happen. Um, and so, you know, it, it, restorative justice has a deep history in the state of Minnesota, actually coming from the Department of Corrections in the 1990s. And so when we brought STAR to Minnesota, it really was a critical time where people, what I'm finding, people are hungry for the information. And when you give them the information, they can take it back to their neighborhoods and their communities, and they can figure out how to do the healing together. So uh, we're very excited about the possibility. So I'm, we are out of, out of time for this discussion. I hope it's whetted your appetite for more discussion. I'd like to close with thanking our awardees and a special thank you to Jalili. You have been such a mentor and a role model and a supporter of peace that it is just such a joy to be here with you to share in the success of these amazing peace builders. Thank you.
Okay, thank you all. And I will say Bria will be with us tomorrow morning on the movement building panel. So you're gonna hear a lot more from her. And Donna and Hamza are gonna be here, so please connect with them and learn about their work. So the next, um, before we move into tomorrow's Peace Builders, um, one of the things, this is a really joyous time to, to meet these brilliant and amazing people, but it's also important that this work is dangerous and we lose, um, we lose people. We lose people that we love and that we work with and that we know. So I wanna take just a moment to um, honor those people. We don't have everyone that was lost in our community, but um, these are a few people that um, were very special to us. So Jeremy Richmond, um, he was a father of a Sandy Hook child. Um, and in this unthinkable tragedy, he created the Aviel Foundation. Um, and the goal was to find out what, he's a neuroscientist, he was a neuroscientist, to find out what, what causes violence in our brains and how do we rewire it back. Um, I, we found Jeremy, I was driving into work one day and heard him interviewed on one of the um, first anniversaries of Sandy Hook. I heard him being interviewed on NPR and I said, I came running into the office and told Melanie, we have to connect with this individual. And he did, we did, he became a senior fellow. He spoke at one of our conferences. Um, so I'm gonna let Melanie say a few words about him since I know how close you were. Thank you, Liz, and to everyone here for honoring Jeremy. If you met Jeremy, he was a force of nature, a deep searching intellect, a puckish sense of humor, loved children, loved science, deeply, deeply dedicated to peace. And I don't want to sugarcoat anything. He hanged himself in the Abiel Foundation's offices this past spring. He was so traumatized by the Parkland shootings. Every time that there was a mass shooting, he felt this pain again. So it shows the ripples of violence never end, that everything we're doing around trauma, around gun control, um, Jeremy would be here cheering us on. And so his memory for me will always be a blessing, as I know it will be for all of you. And I just wanted to, um, when I, I found out, um, I got a text message that morning that he um, uh, died, I immediately pulled up his um, talk at USIP at one of our conferences, and um, this was this is how he closed out the conference. I listened to it all over again, um, and I always remember this: be kind. Everyone you know, everyone you meet, is fighting a hard battle, and everyone is facing great adversity. You can't see those battles, but they are in there, and. Yeah, I, I, I forget who talked about it earlier today. Sometimes we don't practice what we preach. I know I'm guilty of it. Um, uh, be kind. We don't know um, what the battles are inside of everybody. Um, on that uh, changing, um, can you see the next slide? Um, Ambassador John McDonald, we lost this year. Uh, he was a pioneer on uh, multi-track diplomacy. I know I used his work um, when I was at the US government trying to convince the State Department that there were other levels than just track one diplomacy. Um, uh, he, he was a long time diplomat and um, you know, we, he, he, we, he will definitely be missed. Um, the next uh, Catholic Relief Service is one of our um, partners um, lost uh, Sara Kal Kalachu, the next slide. Um, Getnet Al Alamayu, and uh, Sintayu, oh, sorry, uh, Emeku. I lived in Ethiopia, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not doing justice to these names. These were individuals who um, were killed on the Ethiopian uh, flight that went down um, in Africa. And uh, we know it was heartbreaking for CRS to lose, lose this many colleagues at once. Um, I'm now gonna turn it over to Bridget. Bridget Moix, who is another person who needs absolutely no 
introduction in this community as well to talk about some of our Peace Direct colleagues, family that were lost this year. And then we'll take a moment of silence. Thanks, Liz. I'm so appreciative of um, this space to recognize colleagues. Um, we have lost a number of friends and colleagues um, this last year. Um, John Paul Zabika um, worked with us in a um, research project. Um, our, my colleague Megan Renoir sent a note just last week um, about his passing um, and how much he influenced peace building um, in, in every circle that he touched. Um, so we're very sorry to miss, to lose John Paul. And um, some of you may know, um, have known Abdullahi Ise, our friend and partner from Somalia. He was executive director of SADO. And he was here in Washington um, in May, and then we lost him in July. And um, Peace News um, did a remarkable, um, beautiful tribute to him that we'd like to show now. To, to advocate the role of civil society can play in peace building globally and nationally. There are around 2 million IDPs in Somalia, IDPs is internal displaced people that fled from their village and homes and leaving other part of, of the country. They fled because of the conflict, they fled because of uh, insecurity. We have been assisting and supporting people when there was no any uh, form of governance in Somalia. about 70 kilometers and then the car ran out of fuel and then we have to walk for five days until we reach the other region that our clans live. I don't think when we, the, the fighting will defeat one party or it will bring the solution. But peaceful talks can. I cannot do what you can do upon here in America. You cannot do what I can do where I come in Somalia. Civil societies know the problem. They have the history. They, they know the dynamics, they understand the things, what's going on and where it comes from. And that's what needs to be realized and recognized. strongly believe fighting we could not end the fighting. I think peaceful talks and reconciliation will end the fighting.
Um, Issei, our friend, um, was an incredible and courageous peace builder. Uh, one of tens of thousands of courageous peace builders around the world. Um, and Peace Direct, I love that we talk about the Peace Direct family. And so we miss our family members that we lose. Um, but I also know that we continue to celebrate the new members of our family that join us. Um, I used to think courage was an individual act, but I understand now that courage is a group process. And I'm very honored and happy to be here to talk now about the Tomorrow's Peace Builders Awards and announce new members of the Peace Direct family, um, courageous peace builders in their own right, in their own countries, um, who are joining us here uh, tonight to continue our celebration um, of the process of peace building. I'm going to announce the winners of the Tomorrow's Peace Builders Award, and I want to invite uh, the other members of the Peace Direct family to come up and be on stage with me as we do that. So come on up, folks. Um, we've heard this weekend a lot about um, the importance of standing in solidarity with each other. Um, and so we want to give these awards out um, as a family, as the Peace Direct family. For those who may not know the Tomorrow's Peace Builders Awards, I hope you will um, check it out on social media, look at our website, peacedirect.org, um, and learn more about it. It's our annual competition. Uh, each year, we uh, offer three or sometimes four even um, prizes for innovative peace builders often groups who you may not have heard of yet. It celebrates some of the most innovative local peace builders around the world. And this year we had three focus areas for the award, awards. Women-led peace building, youth-led peace building, and music and the performing arts for peace building. The winners, the competitors are judged by an international panel of experts. And this year, we had a record-breaking number of applicants. 406 local peace-building groups from around the world applied. It was wonderful. It's the highest number we've had. So I'm very happy um, to announce the winners. Beginning first, and oh, just to let you know what they get for this prize, um, the Tomorrow's Peace Builders Award includes a $10,000 prize. Um, which goes to the work that they're doing and continuing. Uh, it is a cash prize award. Um, it also includes a five-year membership with the Alliance for Peace Building. So these are some of your new colleagues, um, and we hope they'll continue um, to be here with us at the PeaceCon. And uh, we bring them here for the award ceremony. Um, we hope that you'll have a lot of conversation with them, learn about their work, uh, and we also take them up to New York City to network and meet um, people up in New York uh, in the peace building world. So it's a wonderful opportunity for us, us to get to know them. So, drum roll please. And we have really big checks. <laughs> So, in the category of women-led peace building, and I'll ask our winners to join us on stage as I announce your name, Open Art Space in Syria, represented by one of its founders, Rula Al-Khatib. <laughs> Open Art Space was founded by three women, two artists, you can take your picture now, pose, yeah, 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 it's good. Pose for your pictures, that's why we're here. Um, two, two, three women, two artists, and they founded it in the Syrian capital of Damascus in 2016. Their work connects children and young people inside and outside of Syria through peace building. Children participate in free weekly workshops which offer a safe space to play and connect with one another, a chance to express themselves, and a way to learn about peace through art. They also have a website and online engagement tools. Congratulations. <laughs> Second, in the category of music and the performing arts for peace, the Amani Institute in Democratic Republic of Congo, represented by Joseph Mohindo Tsongo, its founder.
The Amani Institute was founded in 2016 in North Kivu. It uses theater to help young ex-combatants process trauma they have experienced and reintegrate into their communities. The technique of theater enables former fighters to interact with others and acts as a springboard for dialogue, reconciliation, and tolerance. Congratulations, Joseph. And our third category and winner could not be with us here. This is the youth-led peacebuilding category. And the winner is Youth for Homeland in Yemen. Its founder, Abdullah Al-Sarahi, is on the screen. And we have a Yemeni flag here, Abdullah. Um, Abdullah could not be here because of U.S. visa restrictions on Ye all Yemenis. So we have work to do there. We're glad you're here with us, Abdullah. Youth for Homeland was founded in 2014. It works in rural areas of Yemen to engage communities in peacebuilding efforts, working mainly with young people to develop skills and find alternatives to violence. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Peace Direct family. And I just want to also acknowledge another member of the Peace Direct family who's back with us after a long time, Gulalai Ismail from Aware Girls. Some of you may know. Um, she's had a long journey, and she's safely here in the U.S., and we're very thrilled. And she'll be speaking tomorrow. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So if I can ask the uh, winners to sit down, we're going to have a little conversation with you. Thank you so much. You can leave the Put the flag on the chair for, for Abdullah. Um, and we're going to, uh, one of the best ways to see a little bit about their work before we have a short conversation with them is a brief video that we want to show you. So we're going to turn you off, Abdullah, for, for a moment to show the video, and then we'll bring you back. Great, thank you. Um, I want to thank Alex Shelton, who's going to be helping us translate. She didn't know she'd be on stage in front of an audience till this morning, so thanks. Um, Abdullah, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. You are coming through very clear. Wonderful. 
So I'm so um, happy you're here. We have a little time uh, before we rush off to a reception and have a lot more discussion. But we wanted to spend a few minutes um, talking with you. And I just have a, a few questions I want to ask. Um, and the first one is really just tell us your story of how you got involved. You're all founders of your organizations. Um, how did you end up doing this work in peace building? Would you like to start, Rula? Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, we feel really privileged to be part of this and to meet such amazing people um, like everyone in here. Um, open Art Space, it started as a really very humble and simple idea. Um, I don't need to tell you about the war in Syria. You all know about it and you know the hard time that um, the Syrian gone through. Um, my sister, Reem, and me, we thought we don't want to stand on the side. We want to do something to help, um, to help our people and to give hope. Um, so we, we thought, what can we do? Um, basically, we, uh, we wanted an idea that hasn't been done before, uh, so we don't repeat ourselves and we don't repeat the work that someone else is doing. Um, and at the same time, we wanted to use what, um, what is available for us. Uh, my sister Reem, who is watching us online now, um, she, she is um, a very creative artist and she has great experience in working with children, running a program with children and working with external organization. And through her, throughout her professional life, she gained loads of experience. Myself, I'm quite interested in children, myself having children, working with my children, having experience in what they do at school and um, also having interest in, in helping the children. Uh, we decided that we want to do something to help our children. The reason we choose children is because we think they are the most affected by the war um, and we want to help them. Being the, the future of our country, we want to give the help to them. So, um, um, in addition, uh, we don't think there is a great interest in art in our education, so we, think this is some, we thought this is something we can help with, having the experience, uh, we also used our own, um, it's a private gallery that we have, so we used our own place and we provided um, the tools that we, that we need in terms of like, it's very simple tools, coloring paints and pencils, so, um, and that's where the idea came from. So we decided to run weekly um, courses for the, um, um, you know, um, art courses for the children um, to attend, and they are all free, they are all run in, um, um, in, in um, you know, uh, within our capabilities. Um, those, those courses, they had a message. We wanted to, the children to, um, to, to have, um, um, to learn a message when they come to, to, to us. It's the message of peace. So the focus was to, um, um, to, to um, is we don't want to, have to see children running around playing war game. It's, it's normal because that this is, you know, this is what they lived in their childhood. Uh, we don't want them to pretend that they're holding guns. We want them to learn about peace and uh, learn about tolerance. And when they grow up, so they can pass that message through. Um, another thing is uh, we wanted to get closer to them. Um, you know, now, th these days, children are quite interested in technology, quite interested in their phone and tablets. So we thought we can use that tool to get closer to them. And that's how we came with the idea of building a website. The website provides game. It's a puzzle game. Um, and... Um, we use um, drawing uh, about peace. So we use Picasso, um, face and uh, pigeon of peace. Um, so it's a, it's a simple puzzle they can play. There is also um, uh, information about local artists, but it's all artists who worked uh, or done um, uh, drawings about peace. Um, I mean, if you go and search online, you find lots of art about war, but not as much about peace. That's why we are focusing on that. Um, the website also, uh, so it's an addition to be fun education, but it also um, we have videos to the children how to make pieces of, of art, uh, color them, cut them, and then we show them how to take a photo, upload that photo, and then write a message of peace. So say their name and write a message, a message of peace. In that way, we think this is a powerful tool because we're not limited with the physical place we are in. We can take it outside. We can get other children involved. Um, and it's something they like and they enjoy. Thank you so much. And what's the website if people want to check it out? Open Art Space. Thank you. <laughs>
Joseph, um, tell us about your story starting Amani Institute and, and how you came to peace building. Bonsoir. Je parle français, hein? comprenez. Ah bah oui. Je suis content d'être là, à Washington, et c'est pour la première fois. Nous avons commencé à Money Institute parce que nous sommes nés dans la guerre. Nous grandissons dans la guerre. Après le génocide rwandais, 1994, j'étais déjà en train de naître parce que je suis de 1994. Et le génocide est allé s'installer dans l'est du Congo, chez nous pratiquement. Um, first of all, he's very happy to be here, and it's his first time in D.C. Um, he started the organization because he was born during the Rwanda, Rwanda, Rwanda genocide, and it um, had an impact on the east of Congo, where he is from. Je disais que je suis né dans la guerre parce que je suis de 1994, et donc justement pendant les génocides qui est euh, descendu jusque chez nous au Congo et qui continue jusqu'à maintenant dans l'est du pays. So he was born in, during the wartime and genocide was happening on a day-to-day -day basis when he was growing up. Voilà la bonne raison pour moi de commencer une initiative parce que je suis conscient que la paix euh, la solution pour la paix ne, ne peut pas venir euh, par une baguette magique. La solution pour la paix, euh, c est, c est des, il y a des manières plus efficaces pour amener la paix. C'est comme ça. Après tout ce que j'ai vécu, après avoir vu des femmes en train d'être violées, des, des hommes en train d'être tués, et toutes ces scènes d'horreur, je me suis décidé d'utiliser plutôt une arme douce qui est le théâtre forum participatif. Um, so he realized that there were many avenues to get to like a peace, but um, he realized that also it doesn't come up with a magic wand. So he, after seeing a lot of women getting raped and men getting killed, um, he decided to transform that his wand, um, which is theater, and he's using that as a tool, a non-violent tool, to achieve peace. La guerre, les violences dans l'est de la République démocratique du Congo nous a plongé, nous, la génération actuelle, dans, dans une sorte de, de confusion. En tout cas, on ne sait, on ne sait pas quoi faire. Et la seule destinée qui nous reste, c'est d'aller prendre les armes et combattre en s'adhérant dans le groupe armé pour se venger peut-être. Um, so war uh, plunged his generation into confusion, and the only way they could um, fight that war was to pick up the arms and go fight for their lives. Voilà comment j'ai vu des jeunes gens comme moi aller adhérer dans les rangs de groupes armés parce qu'ils ont vu que leurs familles ont été détruites. Imaginez quelqu'un qui a vu sa maman en train d'être violée, son papa en train d'être tué, il est traumatisé. Il, il n'a plus rien à faire, il va décider parce qu'il ne peut plus étudier, il n'a plus de, de, aucun parent qui peut le supporter. Il n'a il a que cette destinée d'aller dans le groupe armées d'aller combattre également. Et euh, voilà tout ce que nous, nous, nous avons vécu euh, ou tout ce que nous vivons alors. Parce que jusqu'à actuellement, nous voyons les sangs couler. Nous voyons la terre consommer les sangs des innocents. Um, kids like him uh, picked up the arms and went to fight because there was no hope anymore and the only thing to do was to go fight and they didn't have any families and they were traumatized by everything that was happening and this was why he started the organization les enfants des jeunes gens vont combattre dans le groupe armé après un moment il y a le gouvernement congolais qui cherche à les 
réinsérer dans la vie civile, notamment par des projets intégrateurs, un programme économique où tu, tu sors de la brousse, on te donne par exemple un vélo ou une moto pour ta réinsertion économique dans la société. Um, so the government, the Congolese uh, government, tries to get these kids out of the armies and by giving them economic incentives, just like a bike or a motorcycle, so that they can reinsert themselves in the society. Malheureusement, on n'a pas tenu compte de de ces volets psychologiques et sociaux, parce que déjà on entra dans la brousse, en adhérant dans les rangs de groupes armés, les enfants, les jeunes gens comme nous, comme moi, apprennent à tuer, apprennent à violer, apprennent à prendre de la drogue, apprennent à faire n'importe quoi. Et les gens qui viennent, le gouvernement qui vient pour la réinsertion, ne, ne prend pas à compte ces volets psychosociaux. Plutôt, on voit la réinsertion économique. But the economic incentives that the government gives uh, don't really have an impact on the younger generation because they're traumatized by everything they've seen and experienced, um, and they don't take into account the psychological aspects of things. Et moi, je suis, je suis un blogueur. J'ai raconté des histoires parce qu'il fallait en parler. Euh, finalement. Je me suis fatigué parce que j'ai assez raconté des histoires de violence, j'ai assez raconté la guerre, j'ai assez la, raconté euh, les sangs qui coulent, j'ai assez raconté des, des scènes de violence. J'ai vécu toutes ces histoires et je me suis dit qu'il ne fallait pas rester, euh, rester là à raconter des histoires et qu'il fallait plutôt agir. Um, so he was a blogger and still is, and he got really tired of um, recounting those stories and telling them repeatedly because it just became the same stories over and over again, and he decided to take action instead of just re repeating them, repeating those stories. J'ai pris une arme. Cette arme, c'est une arme douce. Ça s'appelle le théâtre forum participatif. He decided to take arms, pick up, pick up an arm, but this arm is a non-violent arm and it's called theater. Et avec des amis, des jeunes gens comme moi, on a pris conscience, on a commencé. Et le principe dans ces genres de théâtre, c'est de revivre la violence. Donc nous travaillons dans les psychodrames. Nous, nous, nous faisons des présentations théâtrales euh, en faisant revivre la violence de manière à repenser le plaie qui n'ont pas été euh, bien traité et les, les problèmes intérieurs parce que nous voulons travailler sur les émotions, sur le comportement de, 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 de tous ces, ces gens qui sont parfois de bourreaux sans les savoir, ils ont été de bourreaux ou d'autres qui ont été des victimes. Et donc, nous voulons travailler euh, avec tous ces, toutes ces, ces catégories de gens. Um, so, with his organization and through theater, they actually, perpetrators and victims, relive what they've done, so they act out what they had actually done. And um, that makes them think about the past and what they've what their actions were as a perpetrator and as a victim. Il uh, y avait un phénomène, il y avait déjà un phénomène. Des jeunes gens comme moi qui sont dans la brousse, qui ont appris à violer et à tuer, qui commettent des exactions à leur tour, ont été mal vus dans la société. Et dès qu'ils reviennent de la brousse pour réintégrer la vie civile, ils sont mal vus. Malgré les efforts du gouvernement qui leur donne de moyens, une moto, un vélo, ce n'est pas une petite entreprise pour évoluer, ils étaient mal vus, c'était des barbares, on les traitait de tous les mots parce qu'ils ont, ils ont été mal éduqués. 
Et nous, on s'est dit que c'est là où il fallait travailler. Il fallait montrer dans ces genres de théâtre que ce n'était pas vraiment par leur propre volonté qu'ils ont eu également des problèmes. Um, so a lot of the people who, who perpetrated these actions and went to war and raped women are really like perceived negatively in the society, but um, they don't take into account uh, through the theater, they take into account that it's not, it's just an image of what they're portraying and not who they are at their core. C'est une longue histoire, je vais euh, vite clôturer. Nous travaillons en atelier et ces, a, ces ateliers consistent à des sessions. La première session, c'est la session de relaxation, de décontraction, de, de massage et tout, parce que nous voulons partir de l'expression du corps à l'expression verbale. La deuxième session, c'est maintenant ça, le, le groupe des paroles, où nous, nous voulons écouter les histoires des uns et des autres, les témoignages, parce que euh, nous partons, le principe c'est de partir des problèmes individuels pour trouver des, des, des solutions euh, collectives aux problématiques collectives. Et la troisième session, c'est la mise en scène. Nous proposons à la troisième session aux jeunes gens de jouer ce qu'ils ont vécu. Nous ne travaillons pas seulement avec les, enfants, les anciens enfants soldats, mais également avec tout le monde, et victimes ou bourreaux. Comme ça, si tu as été victime d'une exaction quelconque, tu vas jouer cette peine, cette douleur que tu as ressentie. Si tu as été bourreau, si tu as fait, tu as commis le mal, tu vas nous présenter, tu vas, nous, tu vas essayer de nous, de nous jouer ce que tu avais fait pour essayer de, 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 de libérer, de te libérer de, de ces, ces problèmes qui restent à l'intérieur. Et voilà, en, en trois sessions, après nous, nous, nous allons cibler un public euh, devant lequel nous allons présenter et à la fin nous finissons avec une image euh, de violence, une image de violence. Et nous disons aux spectateurs, voilà l'image que nous allons placarder à Washington, au grand rond-point, à la Maison Blanche, et tout le monde sera content. Les gens déjà avec l'effet miroir du théâtre, ils vont dire, non, non, c'est une image de violence. Maintenant, nous allons proposer à ces gens de venir changer l'image. Et c'est là où nous en arrivons avec la partie euh, participative, participation de, des spectateurs donc je, je... Oh, je... I'll try to summarize because he talks <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's different workshops um, and the first workshop is relaxation so put the peop the victims or the perpetrators um, relax so that they can tell their story the second workshop is telling your story and finding within the group collective solutions to your problems The third workshop is um, acting who you were, whether you were a victim or a perpetrator, and getting in touch with your emotions. And finally, after they do that, they go in front of the public, and it's usually a targeted public, so it'll be different people. He was talking about um, sometimes it's rural, rural women, um, 50 and above, or it'll be younger generation. Um, and after that, they, they stop the scene at the end on a violent image to shock the public and to try and get an emotion from the public. And then the public comes into contact with the actors and they interact with the actors and they change the scene and they change the scene on how they want to see the scene change, whether it's in a good way or a bad way. So it's a very interactive uh, process that helps the public connect with the actors and the actors release their emotions as well, or actors. Thank you so much. Um, that was great, really interesting um, methodology. <laughs> Abdullah, you've been so patient. Abdullah's been with us the whole, this whole session. You just didn't see him. Abdullah, can you tell us your story and how you came to peace building and founding the organization? Uh, it's a longer story, as you know. Uh, since five years ago, uh, it has been a war in Yemen, as you know. Uh, so I saw my people uh, in dangerous. Uh, uh, half of the Yemeni population is young, 
age between 10 and uh, to uh, 35 years. So the future of Yemeni is, we can say, dark because of this. Uh, so me and my friends decided to take a part to help uh, my country and save our future. Uh, and we start our organization since 2014. Do you hear me? Yes, thank you so much. That was great. Um, so we, we're just going to take a couple more minutes um, before we go. And I want to um, start one more round of question and start with you, Abdullah, this time. Um, because you're there in Yemen and you were so sorry that you couldn't be with us. I want to apologize for m the United States government, my government, um, that you were not able to be here because I know you wanted to be and we wanted to be you to be here. So I just want to say that we feel your presence in the room uh, and we feel your spirit and your courage coming through. And my question um, for us here in Washington working on peace building, um, you know, we, we often wonder how do local peace builders, in the midst of the front lines of war zones, how do you maintain hope? What is it that allows you to carry on this important work? Um, so my question is, where do each of you find hope? Um, can we start with you, Abdullah? Yeah, you can. Actually, I can see the hope in the eyes of my people here in Yemen. If you walk down the street, you would see people looking for about peace. They said, where's the peace? Why is the silly war is actually happening? So this is a push us up to uh, do more and more activities, more projects to, to, um, to make the peace around the Yemeni people. The hope actually lay in Yemeni peace and hearts. Thank you so much. Uh, Joseph, would you like to tell us where you find hope? Dans les travaux que nous faisons tous les jours, nous, nous sommes accrochés à l'histoire, à, à l'espoir que euh, les violences communautaires, la guerre finiront et que la paix régnera de part les petites actions pacifiques que nous menons et qui sont en train d'être couronnées de succès au niveau mondial. Um, so he finds hope in uh, believing that war will end and that peace will come and um, he finds uh, greater hope in seeing that little peaceful actions are actually successful and are able to make a a difference. Thank you. Rula. Uh, we get hope from the children themselves. Every day the children inspire us, they give us, give us idea. When we see the, the happiness, the engagement uh, from all the children, um, when we, uh, when they come to us and they feel like they're coming to their family, uh, they, they, I mean, they end in the day, they, they, I mean, it's like they, go, they want to go and see my mom and dad, the two elderly people, and they want to have a suite. They, so they, they get engaged, but they also uh, inspire us. Um, I, I mean, we, we try to take them to other places. We take them, I mean, sometimes we take our workshop to, um, th to theatre, we take it to other galleries. Um, I, I would like to mention quickly uh, a short story about two girls who, who worked with us. Um, Jenna and her, her sister Elena, they, um, they have sadly lost their mom in a bombshell. That left them with a really deep trauma and, and they, they left them really <coughs> close to each other. They, they didn't want to engage with anyone, but they were interested in attending the workshop. Uh, they attended, but they didn't engage much. They, they like to play with colors. They used to draw and then throw their, their, their painting away. Mm -hmm. um, they kept on the side. And um, until one day, we were talking about um, um, the drawing of uh, um, uh, face and pigeon of peace. On that day, Jenna said, oh, I love pigeons. And my mom gave me a pigeon to look after before she died. 
And then her sister said, I really wish if I can send but the, a pigeon to my mom in heaven to say that we love her. And then and on that day, we sat together, we talked about um, you know, the painting, and they, they started to get engaged. Um, I mean, I get goosebumps every time I, I, I remember this story. But this, this basically what gives us hope. Um, I mean, getting the, the, those children outside of their shell and engaged with them, um, that, that, that's, that's, that's the future, and this is what gives us ideas and hope every day. Thank you so much. Well, I can tell you that um, you give us hope. You each um, give us hope, and the work that you're doing with your communities, um, I know, is a bright light uh, in the darkness. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Congratulations again. And at Peace Direct, we have a saying, once part of the Peace Direct family, always part of the Peace Direct family. So we're so glad that, um, that you're, you're here. And please join us for the reception after this at the AFP office, and you'll have more opportunity to speak with them. Abdullah, um, is there a website or a way people might connect with you? Uh, actually, we have uh, uh, a Facebook page. I uh, will send you by email, and all people you can visit and click like. We would love that. Thank you so much. Now, I, Liz, Liz is gone. Liz is doing wrap-ups, or we just send you off to the reception. Oh, we're free. We're free for the reception. Yeah. Yeah. So, so to get to the reception, you just exit and walk straight down Connecticut to DuPont Circle, 1800 Massachusetts Avenue. We'll hope to see you there.